It's officially available. No matter where you at, go grab some of my merch. Click the link in the description and shop the new It's Impossible to Envy a Sucker and Detroit Home of the Hustler shirts and hoodies. What up, though? This your boy, D.O.C., and I got a very special guest on the line. Would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself and what part of Northern California you represent? Yeah, hey, people. It's your boy, Honor Ray Vashon, formerly known as the artist, known as X Braided, the Nefarious. Represent Southside Stacktown Garden Stand Up. Word, definitely. Well, I guess that would be right off the top. I have to ask you. What made you do or uh, change your name? What was the thought process or, you know, in, going into that? It was too far. For one, I did a lot of work, man, in terms of, like, getting my degree and, uh, and just uh, being in recovery and working with these brothers. And one of the things I wanted to do was, like, not to, to represent the authenticity of the streets and like that. And one of the things that we don't need like, I didn't need to wear no mask. I didn't need to invent no character in order to be my mama's son and reach my full potential. So to me, it was like how some brothers want to give up that name. They got the test to them because it ain't organically theirs. That's kind of how I felt. Like, let me let me go back to, to the truth. You know, my grandmama, grandson, my mama's son, and just uh, be me. That's one. It's, and the other reason I had strategically is X-rated, X-rated the name as an artist has a cluttered uh, discography. You know, I got a lot of good music out there. But also, you know, it's just a lot on that name when you put that name in Spotify, when you put that name in a little radio stay, whatever. I wanted to have a clean place to release my music so that when people came to it, you know, there ain't nothing but what I wanted to make that would be available under Honor of Sean. And so that's kind of how I'm rocking. Word. Yeah, that that's definitely smart. That's definitely smart. Well, um, how has the process or the transition been it's so far, you know, trying to, um, I wouldn't say get hit back to things, because I know things have totally changed as far as, you know, streaming, social media sites, all the titles and all that stuff. How has that transition been so far, you know, either learning it or utilizing it for you? I think uh, I kind of kept myself glued, like like glued to the streets, like my ears to the streets. So I was conscious of like the different changes that took place, and you know we little we starting to catch up technologically behind the walls. The brothers is a little bit up to speed because you know we got them tablets now and the global tail link phones and the GTLs and whatever contraband that's on the tier. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, so. You end up learning a lot about all these different uh, mediums that we got nowadays, and it just becomes standard business. So I kind of think I was ready for that. I was watching Rolling Stone, the way that changed, Double XL. I could see the changes that was that was occurring in, in different formats that was working and not working. And I could see the numbers on my own checks. I could see, like, okay, this is where I'm getting my checks from. This is what the money is saying to me. Mm. Yeah. As far as the song, the very first song and video that you put out, how did you uh, like the response that you got back? Because I seen well, nothing, I seen nothing but positivity, like in the comments, it did some uh, nice numbers. Yeah, it was beautiful. You know, that was my goal. Was like, let me just drop this this little quick song so that people know I'm plugged in and like I'm back and I'm serious. It's real quick, and then, you know, the first line, it's that lowest honorary, I'm doing fine, how are you? That was on purpose. Mm -hmm. You know, let me let me just say hi real quick. And so, you know, sometimes you, it's like you, you call your mom sometimes, or, you know, your grandma, sometimes you just say, what's up? I love you real quick, and I'm just taking you straight, yeah, bamming you out. And other times you call, and you might, you might have a lot to say for a couple of hours. So this one was just, a, what's happening, y'all? know what's going on over here and then i'm out and then real quick i'm gonna come with that i'm gonna come with that food right. so right now that was just a hello 
Def. Will that go on the project that you have coming out, or would that just just like kind of like a teaser, and then it won't be on the next project, or will people can people expect to hear that on the next? Um, see, are you putting out a whole album, a EP, or double disc, or anything like that? No, I got an LP. I started out with a twenty-four track LP that I started trimming down once uh, the personality of the album started showing itself because we got a real heavy concept that runs straight through the record and so there you know the wild california dream fit it fits where i put it in terms of like me being paroled from prison so i felt like uh as i made the songs there came a point where other songs accomplished that that better and so you know it, it just didn't it didn't make the final cut it just couldn't fit it's right. just surrounded by science just surrounded by lava and so what was going to go before it and what was going to go after it was just like, it wasn't working. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, so you, you basically, you would consider this like a conceptual album? Like when a person get it, it's painting the whole picture all the way through? Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what it's doing. It's a, it's a journey we're going to take together real quick. I mean, you know, I'm starting out, I call it the execution that x ready. And my point being that, you know, the expectation and the the lifestyle that that character was beholden to, you know, he wasn't going to get, they weren't going to never parole him. Mm. And so, you know, oh, that, that had to die so I could live, you know? Yeah. And so I had to let a lot of that go in terms of what those, the philosophies, x writers philosophies, x writers expectations, all that had to die so that I could work my game up to do what I had to do. To be available for my family and for my for my loved ones and my supporters, the people out there that's been writing me for twenty some years, talking you know about am I okay? Do I need anything? All them people are strangers, and uh, when when strangers write you for twenty years, they ain't strangers no more. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So I feel like I owe them people a lot, and so I almost off the bat like the first song we just killing, and I I I have it where he bang out. He bang out. It's like Hamilton in a way. It's a it's a it's a play. And so I it's a, I call it a performance art piece. But he bang he ready bang out the first verse. He banged out the second verse. He get more aggro, and then the third verse is just almost trying to prove the level of insanity involved in that. I got him just tripping out and saying everything that you know it's what you want. And uh, it's almost hyper sarcastic that first song. Like this, what y'all want. Mm. You know, like, here you go. But it's a ridiculousness to it that I hope people are able to capture. Like, if that was not a sustainable psychology. And I think, like, the first three songs kind of identify that that, that, that that psychology was not sustainable, that hyper-robo-gangster psychology that we see some of these artists try to push. It's just not real. And then you, you also got that hyper-black masculinity issue. I tell the massive misconception on what it means to be a black male in America and what the expectations are. You know, we almost breed our children to be murdered mm. by what we what we what we teach them are the proper responses to certain stimuli. And so that's kind of where I was at with that. You know, I wanted to just identify that I didn't agree with some of that stuff. Definitely, and I'm glad you're saying that because. That at some point, like in the interview, I was going to be coming back around to to that type of point right there. Because I know it's going to be certain people, I know myself, that they didn't do as long of a stint. But hearing, like, your thought process towards the world now, you know, I have known some people that go, they may even do a year, five years, or whatever, come home and still be in the same mindset. So, you know, mm. a lot of the questions make basically will be kind of shift shaped around you know, um, how did you get to this point where you at right now? You know, even, you know, that's, that's basically where my whole thing going to come from is how did you get to the point where you at mentally right now? You know, so hopefully someone else can feed off of that, you know, so, and us being based out of Detroit and I do have, uh, you know, the Detroit and Northern California has a strong connection. It's a, a pipeline there. So it, I do have some fan base from out there, but some that may not know, you know, I wanted to kind of go back, you know, growing up and say like in the 70s and 80s in Sacramento, like how would you explain your upbringing like prior 
to the streets or anything like that, like just as an individual? I had a beautiful, I had a, when you say 70s, I had a beautiful upbringing. I had a very close-knit family. We dominated by five very strong and opinionated women. You know, the, 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 my mother and, and her three sisters and, and one of their best friends, you know, that was almost like a sister. And then my Uncle Michael and, and my aunt, my because of my grandmother's the strength of her personality, everybody kind of orbited my grandmother. In my book, I call it Orbit in the Sun, that chapter. Where I talk about everybody kind of just being orbiting Maxine, my grandmother, and how, you know, she kept her, all the rest of the planets and the moons and the stars. She kept everybody else warm with her, the strength of her life. And so we were doing well. And then, you know, what you don't know as a child, but I didn't know as a child, is that the forces, the COINTEL pros, the Hoovers and the Nixons, and the things that they were putting in place and the Reagans, what they were doing. And uh, so, you know, we were negatively impacted by the war on drugs, negatively impacted by the influx of narcotics in the community. And so we had to, you know, we had to experience some of the stuff that other families experienced that was negative. Right. And uh, you know what I'm talking about. You yeah. know what I mean? That, yeah. The impact of the narcotics being dumped in our communities, factually speaking. Yeah, yeah. See, and that's what I, that was actually my next question was going to ask. Like, uh, would you agree there was a direct correlation between the quote unquote crack era and the gangs migrating um, to Sacramento? Was it like almost like at the exact same time, or like how did you see it through your eyes? I saw it happen. Yeah, it, it, it was simultaneous. It was simultaneous. I saw both them things occurring, the migration. And and we had already kind of had that migration occurring because Sacramento is like this pit stop, you know, for, like, you know, in the beginning when California was first uh, incorporated, Vallejo was the capital of California. Mm. And for a while, you know, the government was utilizing Vallejo, but when they, you know, you had the gold rush. You had all this stuff going on in the state. It was not sustainable for Vallejo to be the capital because of the accessibility to it with the train tracks. And so Sacramento was changed to the capital of California. We were not always originally the capital. So the train stations and the accessibility is what turned it into the capital, you know, hundreds of years ago. And then so what occurred then was that it became this port where people going back and forth from east to west, north to south, and to the Bay Area and back, and to L.A. and back, that, that Sacramento became the conduit. That was the way they, that was the corridor. And so that stayed true. You know, people coming from Seattle down, pass through Sacramento on their way south. Mm. People coming from, from Portland, pass through Sacramento on their way south. It's people coming from the south up, people coming from Phoenix, L.A., San Diego, people, all of those people, even if they wasn't going to SAC, passed through SAC on their way where they were going. And so it was always that particular you know, corridor. And uh, so we saw a lot of different things impact the town, you know, the, the clothing, the, the vernacular. It became this melting pot that reflected the entire state because specifically because of the accessibility, the freeways, the highways, the interstates, everything is running right through there. Mm. Yeah, that's dope. I, and that's crazy because I didn't know, I, you know, since I'm not from there, I always thought Sacramento was, you know, the capital the whole time. That makes a lot of sense. When um, So when them two things hit, around, around what age would you say you were and how do you feel like it personally affected yourself or your uh, intermediate family? I saw, I saw in like the, by the mid eighties. I remember like we, I remember living in our houses. You know, we it was, we were, we was things were going well. A little bit of stability, relationship stability, and then that started disintegrating into these these apartments that disintegrated into some of the some of the more well known projects where we end up having to be. And as a child, you don't understand the things or 
certain things that I saw as a child that didn't make sense then and registered later in relation to clouds of smoke, smoke filled rooms, you know what I mean? And mm-hmm. certain environmental things that I that I peep out now I'm like, uh, you know, these things make sense. But I started seeing that like in the real like eighty five, eighty six, that's when that stuff started really, really, really being apparent to me. But looking back on it like right now, autobiography, it really was like between from eighty two to eighty five, it was a nose dive. Yeah. And did it um I don't wanna say did it automatically did you did it interest you to like when you seen it it made you more curious to you know, go towards it, or did you not want, you know, to be a part of that life at first, or how did that, you know, that transition end up working out? I remember, it was all funny games, you know, you go to junior high school, you go to, and you hear things, kids say things, and pretend to be A, B, C, or D, mm-hmm. but I remember, after my grandma died, because the orbit in the sun, I got another chapter called Supernova, that talk about the death of that sun that we orbited, and so when my grandma died, it scattered the family. There was no matriarch to replace her, or the matriarch in line to replace her was grieving. And so while the adults were grieving, I went to the street with my older cousins. All my older cousins are are from Garden Block Crib. They all from 24th Street, 29th Street, Artie Barnes, uh, George Lee Campbell, Jimmy Broadnax, Lil' Vamp Dog, G-Man. Like these legendary figures out there, Agnes, uh, Simp, Caddy, these are legendary figures out there that's my blood relatives. And so while that older generation was mourning the way they mourned, there was a class in my family that was in the streets. And they was doing it with the garage up, with the speakers on, and just, you know, smoking and drinking and congregating. And, and so that's what I went to. The girls were there, the cars were there, the, all the toys, the dollars, the bikes, they had it all. And so nobody was paying attention and that's where I was. So, you know, while the adults self-medicated and grieved, I went to the set, period. I was on 24th Street and Castle Linda Drive with my cousin. And uh, I was uh, at Nedry Court, Nedry Court, 24th Street with my cousin. But nobody paying attention to what was going on. So that summer, first drink, first smoke, first vagina, and it was all bad, period. Yeah, yeah. That is crazy. See, I'm thinking, I didn't know, and, you know, got to keep in mind, because Detroit is not, like, heavily ruled. It, it, it sprinkles, like, how it is nowadays. You got Bloods and Crips down there everywhere now, but Detroit not really, like, ran by na- the, what I call, like, nationwide gangs and stuff like that. It's more segregated into cliques and stuff like that, so it's... It's interesting to hear 82 to 85, like, the Crips and everything were already around, you know, um, as far as up there. When when they originally started, like, I'm guessing, historically speaking, was it started to, like, protect one another from either racial tension or towards the police? Was that always something in the Sacramento was been going on, police brutality and things like that, even way back then? Or was it more the gang started because of the money opportunity. Right. That's the interesting part of the story, right? I did a study. I feel like one of them cats that if you believe in something, then you travel to its Mecca and you get a bar of what you believe in because you can't believe in what you don't know. Right. And so, like, hip-hop was born on Cedric Ave in the Bronx. Like, everybody should want to know about that. Might want to get a bar to museums. We so busy F our own culture. We don't stop to think about the fact that what, you know, we connected to that fabric and that fabric provided these employment opportunities we got. And so I view game banging the same way. And that made it, uh, you know, critical to understand the struggles uh, of Raymond Washington and, and what drawn Stanley Tukey Williams, what they were on when they did East Side, West Side in L.A. and what the different gangs were out there. And they started as a technically as a positive thing intended to, provide protection to their own neighborhood. So the baby cribs uh, first, you know, that was the origin of the cribs. And that's where the acronym comes from. It's funny people don't know. You know, the C is from the cradle and the RIP is for the grave. That's really what that was. So it was the cradle to the grave and the, and the baby cribs was the original name. And so the cribs originated from that C-R-I-P, cradle to the grave. 
And so they they put the acronym with it to say the Community Revolution in Progress. It took that to the mayor saying, you know, they wanted funding and wanted to be recognized as a legitimate party the way the Panthers were recognized as a legitimate party. And then the mayor wrote them back and told them in order to be able to establish a relationship with the party, they would need to remove revolution from the name because at the time that was a that was an incendiary word. You know, because of the Panthers and people blowing police cars up and all of that. So the word revolution was really, uh, for the government, was going to be difficult to affiliate with. So then they, they, you know, they changed that. And so you have reformation put in there, community reformation in progress. And so to me, I call that the Magwai Crips. There was a little bit of fist fighting. There was a little, you know, it was Magwai Crips. But then somebody, you know, they say you don't feed the you know, feed, what was my boy name? What was the cute little gremlin name? The little Mogwai. Yeah, you can't, you feed him after midnight, years mo, mm. and it go bad, you know? <laughs> yeah. Then you get the Lord, that's when you get the little slimy green one. And so that's kind of what happened to, to Crips and Bloods when the first bodies dropped. The first bodies was the, was the, was the water that wet the gremlin. It was the, it was the food after midnight. And so, the migration, the people migrating were the gremlins. They weren't Mogwais, wasn't getting on the freeway, pushing to Sacramento, pushing it to the Bay Area, pushing to Kansas City, pushing to Seattle. That wasn't no Mogwais. That was that was a fully armed gang members with with with, with kilograms and kilos on their way to get their paper and they was dead serious. And so by the time that made its way to Sacramento, uh one of the first original cats to pull up was, was his name was C. Tom. He was from Compton. And one of his closest affiliates, his name was Samuel Lindley. They call him L.A. Slam. Sometimes they call him L.A. Sam. And he was from Nutty Block, Compton, Crip. And so that particular, they had family up the way. You know, my uncle Barry Woods, the, from the founders, the founder of 24th Street, uh, Garden Block Crip. That was that's his family, and so they was coming up there doing their thing with their family and establishing themselves in the garden and getting their money up there. And uh, a lot of people benefited from their presence, uh, and so that's how we ended up wrapping the block. You know, twenty four hundred block of Meadowview Road, the sixty five hundred block. You got a lot of different things like that, but the garden block being blocked came as a re- result of our relationship to the Nutty Block and the Santana Block Compton Crib Gang who was coming up to drop that, you know, yeah. to do what they do in the town. And that's really, so we, we was always gremlins. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> I feel you. 